Hello everyone, welcome to Shune IS and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to talk about the Supreme Court of India. Now, Supreme Court of India is, I would say, one of the most important topics that we can do for the prelims examination. And uh, because it is such a wide topic, there are too many questions that can be framed from this topic. So, this is one such topic wherein I would say that you can make a uh, more comprehensive, a little more comprehensive notes than you normally tend to make. Okay, we'll talk about it. So, our point is, and there are a lot of application based questions also from this particular topic. So, our responsibility is to understand each and every detail of what the Supreme Court entails and get it in our notes so that we can revise it finally. Okay, so let me just tell you a few things about these sessions that we are having so for the ones who have at attended this session for the very first time see we are doing this revision through mcq's program to prepare you for final revision final revision that you will have one week after one week before prelims right my goal is that i should be able to make you capable of solving questions solving questions that are statement based questions that are according to the recent pattern and uh, the second thing is to make notes to get notes which you will use to revise just one week before the prelims and that one week each day you will be revising one subject and that will be my goal that let's say for polity, you will have maximum to maximum 30 to 40 pages of revision, wherein everything will be there. That is my goal, right? So how do we achieve this goal? Because everything is all about how many times you revise, okay? You make the notes on A4 size sheets. I will tell you exactly what to write, what not to write. So don't worry about that. You make the notes on A4 size sheets and... Uh, Make them on loose A4 size sheets, not bounded, so that you can just arrange them according to your convenience. Okay, that is my suggestion to you. And yes, now with this, let's start. Let me just tell you some basic things which you have to note down uh, for the Supreme Court of India. Now, the Supreme Court of India, many people think that it is only Article 124 which is establishing the Supreme Court of India. Article 124 does talk about that there shall be a Supreme Court of India, etc. But there are a plethora of articles from 124 to 147 that talk about various powers, various jurisdictions, various uh, judges of the Supreme Court. So, 124 to 147 are the articles. Please write this down. The system of a single court system, single system of courts basically, that there are no separate courts for states and union. There are high courts and subordinate courts and at the union level there is the Supreme Court. But ultimately in all the courts of India, the Maibap of all the courts of India is the Supreme Court of India. This is called single system of courts, also called an integrated system of courts. Okay, integrated judiciary. I hope you understand. Now, this is not a very uh, federal feature, right? This is um, this is unitary feature, having an integrated judiciary. You can be asked that from where this feature has been borrowed. So, this system of single system of courts has been borrowed by Government of India Act 1935. Please remember this. Why I am telling you is because whenever there is a unitary feature, we tend to think that we have borrowed it from Canada, right? But this single system of courts we have borrowed from Government of India Act 1935. I hope you understand. Now, another thing. UPSC is getting used to asking uh, date-based questions also. Okay, some random dates, not random, but some important dates in history, it will just pick up. So, Supreme Court of India was inaugurated. Inaugurated on 28th January 1950. So, after the constitution came into force, 
on 26th january 1950 supreme court was inaugurated on 28th january 1950 i hope this is something that you can understand right another thing that you need to remember it is that it succeeded it succeeded the federal court of india it succeeded the federal court of india hmm federal court of india established by uh, government of india act 1935 the this particular uh, supreme court of india has succeeded that court okay however another thing statement based question that can be asked is that whose jurisdiction is bigger the federal court of india or the supreme court of india what do you think whose jurisdiction would be bigger the jurisdiction of our dear supreme court is bigger than the federal court of india simply because the highest level of appeal was earlier with the british privy council right earlier with the british privy council now it is with the supreme court of india fine i hope you understand what this means that our current supreme court is more powerful than its predecessor that is the earlier federal court established by government of india act 1935 all right i hope you have written all of this then moving forward how many judges what is the strength of the judges see upsc is increasingly getting interested in these kind of factual details that originally how many judges were there originally there were 1 plus 7 judges there were total 8 judges one chief justice of india and seven other judges were there today there are 34 judges okay today there are 34 judges all right i hope you can understand that uh that we have constantly increased now another thing we have studied the constitutional amendment acts and how article 368 is there you must remember that to increase the number of puisin judges in the supreme court of india you just need to pass an amendment by ordinary majority that means you don't need to uh, pass it under article 368 so let's say tomorrow if the number of judges have to be increased to 40 then uh, only a simple majority bill would be enough and that would not be a constitutional amendment bill i hope you can understand that fine all of this is clear now that you have written this now let's move on to the first question with reference to the indian judiciary consider the following statements any retired judge of the supreme court of india can be called back to sit and act as a supreme court judge by the chief justice of india with the prior permission of the president of india and a high court in india has the power to review its own judgment as the supreme court does how many uh, which of the given statements are correct this is not how many uh, this is which of the given statements are correct so what do you think see first statement is actually absolutely correct and this is actually given in the indian constitution under article 128 okay so even this can be asked whether this particular thing is given in uh, the judges act the judges inquiry act or what which which is the act or the constitution under which it is given so under article 128 the chief justice of india can call any retired judge to serve for the supreme court of india again of course they cannot force them but uh, this particular permission needs to be taken from president first so the presidential approval have to be taken first and then uh, we can go for calling the uh, the chief justice of india can go for calling the retired judge okay there is no compulsion that the re retired just judge has to concur so first statement is correct second statement has been controversial see this statement is absolutely correct that high court in india does have the power to review its own judgment as the supreme court does but upsc somehow turned this statement wrong in its uh, answer key okay however factually i mean this can be called an error by upsc and uh, i know it is difficult to fathom and interpret that why would upsc do an error like this they must be having their own interpretation whatever but um, 
uh overall a high court in india does have the power to review its own judgment so earlier uh if a high court gave a particular judgment let's say right to privacy is not a part of fundamental rights the high court does have the power to change this and say that no it is a part of fundamental rights right so please note here that both uh, the statements here are correct both one and two are correct i hope you understand that okay now moving on to the next question i will keep on telling you that uh, what are the things that you need to note down fine right consider the following statements about the power of the supreme court to punish for contempt of itself so put a slight heading contempt of court uh, the power of supreme court to punish for contempt of itself is inherent in their sovereign judicial power truth cannot be pleaded as a defense to a charge of contempt of court and apart from the supreme court and high courts no other courts and tribunals hold the inherent power to punish for its contempt see here go one by one the first statement is absolutely correct that supreme court does have the power to punish people if it does not if the people do not uh, listen to what the supreme court is saying in the sense if the if there is an if there is a person on whom attendance has been summoned the supreme court has said that they have to be uh, summoned then they have to attend okay otherwise they can be booked for contempt so i hope that you understand this another very important thing over here is just give me a moment yes another very important thing is uh, that the two kinds of contempt that the supreme court is empowered to do these powers are also there with the high court of india however apart from the supreme court and high court these powers are not there in any other court of india right so although parliament can empower but right now there is no provision that any other tribunal any other so basically let's say let let's imagine national green tribunal is there and they have asked a particular person x to come and be summoned in front of them on this particular date and this x does not turn up national green tribunal does not have any way to actually penalize this person okay so no other court and tribunal hold the inherent power to punish this is absolutely correct first one is absolutely correct however the second one is incorrect see if you were criticizing let's say you were criticizing the supreme court hmm and that criticism came from the fact that for example you were criticizing the collegium system that collegium system is very opaque we will talk about the collegium system also be so collegium system is very opaque you wrote an article on that now supreme court put contempt on you let's say criminal contempt for scandalizing the court for scandalizing the court in a uh, suo moto capacity right but you defend yourself saying that my lord i have just told you the reality i have just told you the truth that there is a collegium system and the collegium system is not um, open to public criticism or public uh, rti also right this is what i have told you so this is truth so truth if you have said truth and if the supreme court of india finds contempt in that or offense in that you can use it as a defense that i was just saying the truth you do not need to punish me under contempt right so only two statements are correct also mention that power to punish for contempt is also a part of supreme court being a court of record right so there is this thing that supreme court is a court of record okay any and every judgment that and this is mentioned in the constitution any and every judgment that the supreme court of india gives or any mark any remark the wordings of supreme court of india are taken as precedents the wordings are taken at their face value and they are respected and they are considered for further judgments being a court of record also means that they can punish the supreme court can punish 
for its contempt. So you can get a question. Ki Supreme Court is a court of record. What does this mean? It means both the two things. That it is a precedent. Uh, whatever Supreme Court says. And it can punish for its contempt as well. Both. Both the things. Okay. Now here please uh, give a heading. Appointment of judges. Appointment of judges. <clears throat> appointment of Supreme Court judges. See, the very first thing is that appointment in do is done by the president. Then you need to have a clarity of a few cases. Four cases actually. Very easy names. You don't need to remember the real names. You just need to remember first judge's case, second judge's case, third judge's case, and fourth judge's case. Okay. These four cases. You don't need to remember the names really as such. So, uh, in these cases, the Supreme Court has constantly interpreted how the Supreme Court judges have to be appointed. In the first judge's case, the Supreme Court clearly said that the Chief Justice of India, it is written that the President will appoint the uh, Chief Justice of India and other judges of India. Uh, of the Supreme Court on the advice of Chief Justice of India. Consultation of Chief Justice of India. So, in the first judge's case, the Supreme Court says that consultation, consultation is not equal to concurrence. Basically, what does it mean? That even if the name of a particular judge has been rec recommended by the Chief Justice of India to be made the uh, judge of Supreme Court, the president does not have to concur to it. Okay, president does not have to concur to it. This is the first judge's case. That means they have given executive a bigger position than judiciary. Fine, that is clear. Now it comes to second judge's case. The second judge's case said that no, I'm sorry, this is wrong. Second judge's case was in 1993. Second judge's case said that consultation with the Chief Justice of India equals to concurrence. Equals to concurrence. That means the President of India, that is the basically the union government, they are not free to appoint anyone and everyone who they want as the judge. Right? They have to concur to what the Chief Justice of India is saying. So, advice tendered by the Supreme, uh, by the Chief Justice of India is binding. What they did was, they made the executive subordinate to the judiciary. Fine. Now, another thing. The second judge's case is said to be the case wherein the collegium system is born. Why? Because it was said that Chief Justice of India, along with his two senior most counterparts, two senior most Supreme Court judges, have to be giving the advice to the president of India, right? Now, collegium system was born in the second judge's case. This was where the collegium system was born. It was not made official as of now and collegium word is not mentioned in the constitution of India also. You must be knowing that. But second judge's case was the case when the collegium system was born. Then third judge's case may, third judge's case may, the Supreme Court of India continued its stand. 1998 may case hua tha. It continued its stand, but it just said that the consultation has to be with the plurality of judges. Consultation has to be with the plurality of judges. Are you understanding that there have to be multiple judges? Second, uh, second judge's case said that there have to be one plus two. Here it is said it has to be 1 plus 4, right? One Chief Justice of India has to consult four senior most judges of the Supreme Court and then recommend to the President of India to appoint these people as the Supreme Court judges, right? That is there. Now, before the fourth judge's case, here is a small appearance wherein I want you to write what happened from the side of the executive from the side of the legislature 
the legislature passed the 99th constitutional amendment act this 99th constitutional amendment act was passed in 2014 and this created a new body national judicial appointment commission national judicial appointments commission had an equality of members from the executive and the judiciary okay executive and judiciary both had three members each okay so what they tried to do was they tried to create a formal body which would uh, eventually maybe be under uh, judicial review also maybe who knows but they uh, tried to create a formal body and they tried to uh, include the executive members also so for example law minister was included okay but this njac was deemed unconstitutional the very next year in the fourth judge's case fourth judge's case is in 2015 and in this fourth judge's case it was said that national judicial appointment commission and 99th constitutional amendment act are unconstitutional because they are violating the independence and autonomy and everything of the judiciary okay judiciary should be separated from the executive that is mentioned in article 50 and um, the separation of powers between judiciary and executive is mentioned and that is why we have to adhere to that right now the position remains the same as was given in the third judge's case that we have to have a plurality of judges who will recommend the appointment of supreme court judges okay that is fine all right, now that we are done with this particular topic, let's move on to the next question. Consider the following statements about the jurisdiction to order arrest in contempt cases. The power to order arrest is a punitive measure in contempt cases. Subordinate courts can order the arrest of a person in a contempt case. And contempt of court may involve scandalizing or lowering the authority of any court which of the above statements are correct see go one by one we know that second statement is incorrect subordinate courts do not have contempt power so this is incorrect power to order arrest is obviously a punitive power no because they are giving punishment so whenever you're giving punishment you are giving a punitive uh, power so this is correct Contempt of court may involve scandalizing or lowering the authority. That is actually correct. And this is called criminal contempt of court. And this is a, uh, this is a very uh, controversial topic also that how do you decide that the authority has been scandalized? But anyway, that is from Maine's perspective. What we need to understand from Prelim's perspective is that contempt of court cannot be ordered by subordinate courts. It does involve uh, scandalizing or lowering the authority of any court. And uh, the power to arrest is a part of contempt of court. So, only two statements here are correct. I hope you understand that. Next question. Consider the following statements regarding the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has original jurisdiction in disputes arising out of any pre-constitutional treaty or agreement. The Supreme Court has exclusive original jurisdiction in interstate water disputes and the Supreme Court can issue writs like habeas corpus, mandamus, prohibition, quo varonto and certiorari for the enforcement of legal rights. How many of the above statements are correct? Read each and every statement very very carefully till the last word. The first statement is a fact and this is incorrect actually that Supreme Court does not have power up around any pre-constitutional treaty. Only Parliament has that power. Okay. Because Supreme Court works according to the Constitution. Right. And anything that happens before the Constitution is not a concern of the Supreme Court. That is up to the Parliament. Right. Just understand the logic of it. Okay. So this one is incorrect. Then Supreme Court has exclusive original jurisdiction in interstate water disputes? No. Interstate water disputes are in fact away from Supreme Court's jurisdiction under Article 262. It is the Parliament who has to create the tribunal, interstate uh, water dispute tribunal that will actually solve the disputes that they have. Right. There is no 
no role of supreme court however please write down over here that supreme court does have original and exclusive jurisdiction on federal matters on federal matters now you would say ki interstate uh, river water dispute is also a federal matter matter yes that is a federal matter but it is a way it is specifically written that it will not be handled by supreme court but it is it is a federal matter for sure so what are federal matters when there is center versus state right then another federal matter can be state versus state another federal matter can be center plus state versus another state okay so any kind of uh, permutation and combination can happen but the thing is that if not supreme court then which other court will exercise jurisdiction because if you give this jurisdiction to high court then high court will belong to some or the other state right and uh, they will have some biases so this kind of issue makes supreme court the only court which is eligible under article 131 for federal matters and that is why this jurisdiction is not just original it is also exclusive original jurisdiction is also uh, covered under writ jurisdiction right even the power to issue writs for the violation of fundamental rights is an original jurisdiction what is original jurisdiction you can directly go to the supreme court that is original jurisdiction okay you can't go directly to a, to the supreme court for a theft case or a divorce case or a marriage or no but you can go to the supreme court for a case of uh, violation of your right to life or if there has been a case of untouchability right that is original but that is not exclusive because article 226 also empowers the high court to issue writs but this federal matter is exclusive right federal powers are exclusive for the supreme court i hope you understand that so second statement is incorrect now third statement has been correct till almost the end if you read it till the end if you did not read it till the end you would mark it correct but please my dear understand that each and every word here is important just a second yeah till here it is correct but for the enforcement of legal rights no the supreme court will issue writs only for the enforcement of fundamental rights and that is why we say that the writ jurisdiction of high court is broader is wider than the writ jurisdiction of supreme court because the high court can issue writs for legal rights also i hope you understand that and i know that many of you would be would have done this particular statement as correct and uh, you would not have read because it's the third statement within the third statement also it's the last part so many people take it for granted and don't go till the last part and that is something that should not be done so this becomes incorrect so here the answer is actually d none of the given statements are correct i hope you understand that moving on which of the following powers of the supreme court allows it to declare the legislative and executive actions contrary to fundamental rights as void original jurisdiction appellate jurisdiction writ jurisdiction or power granted by article 13 see just because we are studying supreme court right now you do not have to imagine that i have to fit in the answer from the chapter of m lakshmikant which whatever is written in the chapter of m lakshmikant in the supreme court chapter i have to find the answer from there only apply your common sense this is a very straight forward answer it is article 13 which clearly says that any any law that is uh, that is against the fundamental rights that is violating the fundamental rights that is violating the part 3 of the constitution is supposed to be null and void and supreme court will declare it so okay so that is why the answer to this is d now we will talk about a little bit about the jurisdictions so we have talked about the original jurisdiction we will also talk about the appellate jurisdiction appellate jurisdiction is that supreme court is the highest court of appeal okay supreme court 
is the highest court of appeal there is no court in, uh, which is uh, beyond the supreme court in india that you can appeal to yes you can put up a mercy petition uh, in the uh, in front of the president that is there but overall there is no court which uh, is above the supreme court that is there in the matters of appeal okay so that is the appellate jurisdiction then beyond this we have already talked about the writ jurisdiction writ jurisdiction there are five writs that supreme court enforces only for fundamental rights not for legal rights okay then there is another uh, jurisdiction which is called advisory jurisdiction okay advisory jurisdiction now advisory jurisdiction has two parts president can take advice of the supreme court on various matters there there can be two matters one can be on public order public uh, matters issues of public importance etc now if the uh, if the advice sought is related to public matters of importance etc then it is not mandatory for the supreme court to give advice not mandatory supreme court can refuse so for example let's say it is a religious matter okay and supreme court does not want to comment on it supreme court does not want to give uh, advice on it supreme court can refuse to do so but another part of advisory uh, jurisdiction is that the president can ask the supreme court for any pre constitutional pre constitutional matter and when the advice is for the pre constitutional matter supreme court is obliged it, it is obligatory for the supreme court to actually give advice okay but again this advisory jurisdiction any advice that the supreme court gives is not binding on the president of india is not binding and this is very obvious i don't have to explain why it is not binding because there is separation of powers between uh, legislature and executive uh, and uh, judiciary executive and judiciary primary so that is there then what are the other powers of supreme court one power that we definitely need to talk about is the power of judicial review right for example article 13 that we just talked about is also a power of judicial review but this is very important to understand that first of all supreme court can review the matters of both union and states right union and states but supreme court will not review the matters which are political in nature political matters will not be reviewed right which person joined which political party said what statement no unless and until it is a legal matter it will not be judged by the supreme court of india i hope you understand then the biggest function of supreme court in reality is the function of and the power of constitutional interpretation the power to interpret the constitution okay if you remember the power to interpret the constitution is given in the lok sabha to the speaker in the rajya sabha to the chairperson but overall for the general masses this power lies with the supreme court of india right this is the biggest power supreme court is the ultimate interpreter of um, the indian constitution and for that supreme court uh, uses a lot of doctrines right doctrine of severability doctrine of eclipse doctrine of pith and substance colorable legislation we have talked about it right in the initial uh, lecture so you can watch that lecture right so these are the powers of supreme court and you can just make small mentions in your notes your notes for supreme court should not be exceeding more than 2 to 2 and a half pages maximum 3 pages 3 pages also is a lot for a single topic but supreme court is a big topic so you can have still have three pages question number 6 consider the following statements about removal of judges by impeachment in the supreme court according to the constitution a judge of the supreme court can be only removed for his misbehavior or incapacity the constitution provides the impeachment process leading to the removal of the supreme court judges until now the impeachment process was not initiated against any supreme court judges 
how many of the given statements are correct see uh first statement is absolutely correct and i want you to write this down in your notes that uh, according to the constitution only two bases are there one is pro proved misbehavior or proved incapacity so proved misbehavior or incapacity is the are the only two bases which are mentioned and again they are very wide bases no doubt about it so there can be a lot of um, lot of subjectivity over there however the removal process of the supreme court of india judges is so difficult that it is very it, there has been no impeachment yet but there have been initiations for impeachment okay no judge has been impeached but impeachment motion has been initiated by, uh, against justice v ramaswamy justice v ramaswamy and the removal was actually accepted by the speaker also the removal motion was accepted by the speaker also but it was not passed by the lok sabha right now let's discuss how the procedure of removal goes so the third statement becomes incorrect Const and the second statement constitution provides the impeachment process no it is provided by the judges inquiry act okay it is provided by the judges inquiry act so you can note this down also so now just write procedure for removal mentioned in the judges inquiry act not in the constitution so judges inquiry act uh that is an act of 1968 it talks about the first thing that there has to be a resolution the first thing there has to be a resolution that has to be passed the removal motion has to be supported by 100 members if it is coming in lok sabha and 50 members if it is coming in rajya sabha this also tells you that the removal motion for the supreme court judges can be initiated in either house of the parliament right this is this is ancillary knowledge you need to develop this knowledge you need to uh, make the linkages in such a way that okay this is saying this so uh, now both the houses can be used for initiating motions now second and very important step where we understand how important the presiding officer is the presiding officer which is the speaker or the chairperson of rajya sabha who is the vice president of india may or may not admit it may or may not admit this particular motion and this is very very important to understand that even despite uh, the entire lok sabha 100 people supporting this resolution and 50 people supporting this resolution and vice versa um uh, it is not mandatory for the speaker to actually accept this motion the speaker can refuse to accept this motion once this motion has been accepted once this resolution has been accepted the third step is the creation of a three member inquiry committee three member inquiry committee that what was the issue three member inquiry committee that actually did the uh, this actually did this judge have uh, ha has misbehaved or is there incapacity what is this now this particular committee and because upsc is going so much in detail this three member committee they it will be having the chief justice of india the chief justice of india chief justice of the supreme court then chief justice of a high court okay and a distinguished jurist okay so chief justice of india chief justice of high court and a distinguished jurist and this was a criticism also because one of the former chief justices was accused of sexual uh, harassment and he presided over the meeting that was discusses discussing his conduct only right so that was a very dark period in our indian uh, judiciary which has happened very recently so after the committee has taken uh, taken up all the necessary issues and all the investigations then the matter will be put to vote okay the matter will be put to vote and in both the houses of parliament separately it has to be passed by a special majority separately it has to be passed by a special majority and that is why no judge has been impeached till now 
there have been impeachment proceedings that have begun against a judge but no judge has been impeached right now so this is the procedure i hope you will remember this it's very easy to remember 100 members for lok sabha 50 members for rajya sabha this is the one fact that you need to definitely remember so that is there the procedure is not mentioned in the constitution the procedure is mentioned in the judges inquiry act next question consider the following assertions about the supreme court's appellate jurisdiction in criminal cases the supreme court entertains appeals against a high court decision that awards death sentence to the accused an appeal can be brought to the supreme court if a case is withdrawn from a lower court to a high court an appeal in all the criminal cases can be made to the supreme court without any certification from the high court how many of the given statements are correct c any matter can be sent to the supreme court of india right any matter can be sent to the supreme court of india especially when it is uh, regarding a high court which has awarded a death sentence however if it is just a criminal matter then the high court has to be very sure whether this matter has to reach the supreme court or whether it can be resolved at a lower level also at the level of high court or at the level of subordinate court so if a criminal matter is being passed on to the supreme court of india there has to be an assertion by the high court of that particular state saying that this matter has to be transferred to the supreme court of india are you understanding what i'm saying so first statement is correct second statement is also correct third statement is incorrect that if a criminal case is going to the supreme court of india there has to be a certification by the high court of that particular state that why this has to go to the supreme court of india so only two statements are correct over here and you can mark this up next question which of the following statements regarding the supreme court's advisory jurisdiction is correct the president is bound to accept the advice given by the supreme court the supreme court may refuse to give its advice on questions of law or fact of public importance this jurisdiction is limited to matters arising after the constitution came into effect how many of the given statements are correct we have already talked about this president is definitely not bound to accept this advice any advice by supreme court Pres uh, the supreme court may refuse to give its advice on question of importance yes this is absolutely correct but the third one no this is wrong actually that uh, the constitution before it started and if president is wanting to know something about it there is obligation of the supreme court of india obligation on the supreme court of india that the supreme court of india has actually got to um, give their particular advice okay so the third statement becomes incorrect only one statement remains to be correct i hope you understand next one another thing please write this uh, write about special leave petition special leave petition this is a very powerful tool that supreme court has special leave petition is mentioned in under article 136 and it gives the supreme court the right to set aside any matter and take up a matter which uh, which uh, needs this special leave so it comes under special leave petition and this is a discretion so if under article 136 the supreme court thinks that uh, they should set aside other matters because your matter is of urgent public importance or you know something very very crucial for the upholding of justice they can set aside every constitutional criminal appellate advisory every matter that they are doing and grant a special leave petition however does it mean that granting of a special leave petition is a matter of right no it is not a right that means it completely depends on the supreme court whether the supreme court thinks fit that your matter should be important enough that other matters are set apart that means that special leave petition is not like article 32 because under article 32 if your fundamental rights are violated supreme court is bound to take up your case not for special leave petition 
okay so this is one very important article and very powerful article another is article 142 and this particular article has been asked in upsc earlier 142 is about the power to do complete justice article 142 gives the power to do complete justice to the supreme court of india without any or every procedure without anything if the supreme court of india feels and if it concurs that uh, there needs to be special uh, you know special uh, intrusion of a particular in a particular matter they can actually do it so the power to do complete justice is there with the supreme court of india so these two articles make it very very powerful next one the supreme court has the power to issue writs consider the following statements regarding this power the supreme court's writ jurisdiction is exclusive high courts cannot issue writs supreme court can issue writs for the enforcement of any legal rights and the high courts can issue writs with the enforcement of fundamental rights writs for the uh, enforcement of fundamental rights how many of the given statements are correct see as you keep going forward you will find that you will keep on getting questions easily right questions will start appearing easy to you because now your knowledge is being accumulated you are constantly testing your knowledge also and you are applying that knowledge from one topic to the other right so you already know that supreme court's jurisdiction is not exclusive when it comes to writs even high court under article 226 is empowered to issue writs so this is incorrect supreme court can issue writs for enforcement of any legal rights no it is not empowered to do so only for fundamental rights and we have discussed this multiple times now the third one high courts can issue the writs for enforcement of fundamental rights this is absolutely correct you need to understand this that uh, high courts jurisdiction is wider than the supreme court we have talked about it so here and when there are so many terms which have uh, so many statements which have similar terms and you know saying similar things you tend to lose track so you have to be very 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 conscious on what you are reading so only one statement even after knowing that only one statement is correct you might end up marking c by mistake don't do that do not mess up even one question in your prelims examination because of a silly mistake not even one question should go to waste because of a silly mistake because that one question might decide your inclusion or your in exclusion from the preliminary examination are you understanding that very important which of the following matters fall under supreme court's appellate jurisdiction appeals in civil cases involving disputes over property and marriage appeals in criminal cases where a death sentence has been awarded by the high court and appeals in constitutional cases certified by the high court to involve substantial question of law here all the three lie in the appellate jurisdiction if i were to say the appellate jurisdiction of supreme court is the widest jurisdiction of supreme court that it has okay it is the widest because anyone can come and appeal to the supreme court that way of course with the high court's approval so please write this down all three are correct next question under what circumstances can the supreme court grant special leave to appeal it is a matter of right it can be granted only for final judgments it can be related to any matter and it can be granted against any court we have discussed about special leave petition it is not a matter of right another thing please write down in the special leave petition that it can be issued at any stage of the judgment right it can be issued while the matter is running it can be issued when the matter is over anything right so it is not necessary that only for final judgments it will be there it can be related to any matter yes it can be granted against any court yes both these are correct so only two statements become correct now this was the last question for the supreme court of india and i know it's an, it has been a pretty long class now what i want you to do is like we do always go to your book m lakshmi kant read the chapter of supreme court of india there are a lot of unnecessary details that are mentioned i have tried to cut that down as much as possible make a clear guideline for yourself that not more than 3 page notes 
should complete your entire Supreme Court of India topic. Okay, so maximum three pages are going to be there in your Supreme Court revision notes. Read that chapter and then cut it out of your life till the prelims examination and keep on revising from the notes that you have made from this class and added on from M. Lakshmi Khan. That is my goal for you as I always tell you. Right. So with this, the class has ended for this particular topic. Supreme Court of India has done from my side. And uh, let me just tell you a little bit about this revised entire prelim syllabus through 3000 plus MCQs. Our goal is to make maximum utility of your time and uh, not waste your time at this crucial juncture at all. So we are trying to make you revise through, uh, uh, through MCQs the topics that are going to be asked for prelims that is modern history, Indian polity, geography, economy, art and culture, current affairs, ancient medieval, environment, ecology and science and tech. These are the topics which these are the subjects from which topics are asked from which questions are asked so all of it we are going to cover in our in our um, in this particular course so if you want to know a little bit more about this course you can contact on this number or on this website right uh, you can get to know a little bit more about it and we have tried to keep it very very affordable so that everyone can afford this course and uh, streamline their preparation get into answer solving question solving mode because everyone is scared of the prelims examination if they are sitting and this kind of new pattern that has come up it has made people more scared so in order to reduce your uh, you know reduce your uh, fear of this particular examination. This is what we have planned. So that is all for this class. I hope you derived some value out of it. Uh, I'll see you all in the next one. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.